<laughs> so uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Aaron here tonight. So Aaron is a socio-cultural anthropologist and he teaches at two places actually. He teaches at California State University East Bay and also St. Mary's College of California. And he's published widely on education, sports, culture, power, violence, and social justice in Japan. And tonight he's going to be talking about his um, book that came out a while ago uh, called Discourses of Discipline, an Anthropology of Corporal Punishment in Japan's School and Sports. And it's currently being translated into Japanese and it's already available for pre-order on Amazon if you want to get the Japanese version and I think that's pretty much um, you know when you get translated into Japanese that's pretty much evidence that it's good good stuff right or at least it's going to make waves in Japan so congratulations on that forthcoming publication uh, so he's going to talk us through his research tonight um, and we'll have time for a Q&A at the end just a reminder I'll remind you again later but please type your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens uh, there's no uh, ability to raise your hand or use your microphone, so everything comes through the Q&A button. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Aaron. He's going to upload his presentation. I'm going to um, just turn my camera off and everything while he does that, and I'll come back later. But it's a real pleasure to have you, Aaron. Welcome. Thank you very much, Helen. That's a very, very nice introduction, and I, I really appreciate um, you and Charles Thailandier of Seoul inviting me and, and welcoming me to this um, this research seminar series. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I, uh, I did my graduate studies in the UK, and so I, I wish I could physically be in the UK right now giving this, um, this talk because I have fantastic memories of my time living there and uh, miss it every day. So I know that we have a very global audience today, uh, but I just wanted to make that known to all the people who uh, live in Britain. So today I'll talk about um, the research I've done on corporal punishment in Japan, and um, I titled it Discourse of Discipline, the same uh, title as my book, which, um, as Helen uh, nicely pointed out, is um, is being translated. And it should be out in about a month. So if you know anyone who um, is interested in this topic and, and reads Japanese or prefers to read in Japanese over English, uh, please let them know about that. So the presentation today, I'll, I'll follow this um, loose format. I'll, talk about corporal punishment worldwide, a little bit in the UK and the US. Keeping in mind, please, that I'm, I'm no expert on corporal punishment in either the US or the UK. Um, but then I'm going to shift gears and talk about what's called Taibatsu in Japan. And I'm going to talk about its definition and how it's quite difficult to define exactly what it is. And then um, because of that, I'll encourage you to think about the different contexts in which it takes place and why. Uh, including socialization, the education system, uh, links to the economy, and then sports. And finally, we'll I'll talk about some purported causes that uh, people believe are the reason why corporal punishment or taibatsu exists in Japan. And um, I just want to point out that in the book itself, there's a lot more um, than what I'll be able to talk about today, just due to time constraints. Um, chapter two is about history. Chapter four is about ethics. Chapter five, I go through... Um, uh, some critiques of Nihon Jin Ron explanations of, of Taibatsu. This is uh, these are theories of Japaneseness that um, play a pretty significant role in the explanations of Taibatsu. And then I also have a, a final chapter on um, power and discipline, where I apply Foucauldian theory to uh, to an analysis of of why Taibatsu seems to persist in Japan. And so, unfortunately, I won't have time to, to go over that today. I mean, we can talk about it in the Q&A if anybody's interested. Um, but, um, but that's the loose uh, outline for today. Um, and I really do look forward to this Q&A. In fact, uh, I think I'm looking forward to the Q&A more than anything, because I've talked about corporal punishment in Japan so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to learning something new about it from all of you. So without further ado, this is um, a little bit about me. Uh, my training is actually in political theory and philosophy, um, as well as social anthropology. And a lot of my work is um, multidisciplinary as a result of that. I teach actually in kinesiology departments, which is the study of the moving body uh, at two universities in the United States. And I also work for Japan Intercultural Consulting on the side. So as Helen mentioned, um, these are the interests that I have as a researcher um, 
politics and philosophy of the moving body, sports and society, and as education, coaching pedagogy, culture, discipline, violence, gender, power, and athlete and scholar activism. So I'm currently working on a few different projects. One is um, a book that I've been working on for quite a long time now about big time women's college basketball in the United States it has nothing to do with Japan at all. Um, but it is a really fascinating topic nonetheless. And uh, I'm also drafting a book now on basketball in Japan, which uh, I hope to submit to a, a press soon. So um, I also am really interested in this idea of scholar activism and engaged anthropology. And so I'm writing an article about that right now. And I'm um, going to be launching a podcast soon called The Power of Sports, which is related to that engaged anthropology project that I'm doing. And finally, these are my two sons, um, Morrison and Emmanuel. We call them Maury and Manny, just so we can confuse everybody in our family. Um, I am not the only one who calls the older one by the younger one's name and the younger one by the older one's name. It does happen quite a bit. And speaking of children, um, the United Nations, as many of you may know, uh, had a convention on the rights of the child in 1989. And what some people don't know is that in that convention, there's actually something about corporal punishment. And, um, and, and that is if you believe that corporal punishment is a form of violence or abuse, and not all people do. But um, this is what the Article 19 of the convention reads. And it, it says, parties shall take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social, and educational measures to protect, protect the child from all forms of physical or mental violence, injury or abuse, neglect, or negligent treatment, maltreatment, or exploitation, including sexual abuse, while in the care of parents, legal guardians, or any other person who has the care of the child. So since that time, um, oops, I can't, there we go. Since that time, there have been um, more countries that have banned corporal punishment in some settings, but not all settings. And so it's important to really distinguish when we talk about corporal punishment, uh, the setting that we're talking about. It could be the home, could be the school, could be the penal system and all other alternative care settings. In my research, I focus primarily on the school and sports. Um, but as you can see here, by 2009, there were 27 countries that have ratified uh, the UN CRC, the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and in terms of all spaces where corporal punishment might occur. So that's not really that many, if you think about it. And um, this source uh, for this image here is from Save the Children Sweden. And you can see there's uh, a lot of countries missing from this. And this is um, countries with a ban on corporal punishment of children. And part of the reason for this is because there's very few countries uh, relative to the total number of countries that ban corporal punishment in the home. There seems to be a uh, disincentive for politicians to uh, put a ban on parents using this practice against their own children. But schools are a different matter, often because they're funded by the state and there's uh, legal liability uh, that is uh, at stake. But um, it's important to distinguish between these two realms. Unfortunately, we really just don't have great global data on bans in sports settings. And uh, I, would, I would love to see more of that come out over the next uh, few years, because I do think that cor corporal punishment or violence and abuse of very, in various forms, including hazing from senior to junior members of sports clubs, is something that you see worldwide. You know, how much of a problem it is, well, it's very difficult to say, because again, we don't have great global data. Just a little bit about corporal punishment in the UK for some context. Um, corporal punishment is prohibited in all settings in Scotland and Wales. Prohibition is still to be achieved in the home, some alternative care settings, daycare and penal institutions in England and Northern Ireland. But in other words, it is prohibited in the schools of England and Northern Ireland. And this is, again, a, the source is this um, advocacy group called ncorporalpunishment.org, which has a great number of resources if you're interested on corporal punishment globally, but they say that corporal punishment was prohibited in the UK in all state-supported education in 1986, and the prohibition was extended to cover private schools in England and Wales in 1998, in Scotland in 2000, and in Northern Ireland in 2003. But in 2014, the government confirmed that legislation does not prohibit corporal punishment in unregistered independent settings providing part-time part education. So that's kind of an interesting um, 
little nuance there, which I'd love to get feedback uh, from any of you who live and uh, work in, in settings uh, related here. <clears throat> so one interesting study I came across recently was this notion that, <clears throat> pardon me, English law might actually be to blame for fewer bans on corporal punishment in schools. You can see this graph here from um, a website called The Conversation, which was written by some scholars in the United States. And if anybody wants the information, I can share it with you later. <clears throat> but apparently, if the country has an English legal origin, then they're less likely to have banned corporal punishment in schools, which I think is quite interesting. Now, on the other hand, you can see in this graph that bans in, in both English legal origin countries and other legal origin countries have been growing since the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. So um, if you are not a fan of corporal punishment, then you might consider this to be progress. Now, the question becomes um, whether this, uh, this law, this English legal origin issue has anything to do with what's called in loco parentis or restraints on state actors. Um, and so the US, US Supreme Court uh, has decided that public schools have more limited authority to use corporal punishment than private schools, because in the latter, the, doctor of in, the doctrine of in loco parentis applies. So this means in the place of the parent. And the idea is that a parent can transfer their authority to discipline or punish their children to a teacher. And I suppose that in a private school, if parents are paying a lot of money for their children to be there, then this uh, principle applies. But on the other hand, um, there is not the same right uh, transferred in private schools. So it seems that state law overrides a teacher's right to physically punish in some states while in others the distinction between public and private schools is essential in determining whether a teacher has this right and to what degree she or he can exercise it. And you can see this um, on this next slide, just one second. Um, This is the next slide. You can see in the United States, there are uh, many states that happen to be known as politically red states that have legal corporal punishment uh, still in schools, but in many of the blue states, which are represented here in blue as well, <clears throat> pardon me, they, um, they ban corporal punishment in schools. So I'll just go back here a couple of slides to show you um, this question, if English law is to blame, is it because of the principle of, loco, of in loco parentis? Now, the corresponding phrase in Japanese is oya, oya no kawari, and uh, holds that, you know, teachers are stand-ins for parents. But we don't really have any uh, legal uh, basis to answer these following questions. What about sports coaches? Does the same apply to them? What if they are teachers at the school? What if the sports club is affiliated with the school? What if it is not? So again, similar to the data on um, prohibitions of corporal punishment and prevalence of corporal punishment in sports, we just don't know whether this right is being transferred to um, sports coaches or not, and whether it should be. So um, I find this really to be quite an interesting statement, uh, again, from this endcorporalpunishment.org, but they say there's no prohibition in the United States at a federal level in all public and private schools. In 1977, the U.S. Supreme Court found that the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, did not apply to school students and that teachers could punish children without parental permission. Just makes me think of Pink Floyd and um, uh, I forget the name of the song. Maybe it's another brick in the wall, but uh, this really does sort of feed into um, a distaste for schools that I think a lot of uh, American students have, which is unfortunate. But why shouldn't uh, students in the United States be um, covered by the Eighth Amendment, which protects them, should protect them from cruel and unusual punishment. I think that's a very strange decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, so you can see here's another graph of the United States, and you can see where uh, there appears to be more corporal punishment than in other places. Again, really focused down in the southern region of the United States and a lot of states that are politically red. So the question is really why? Why aren't there more bans and why don't these bans seem to work, especially as I'll show you later in sports settings? It does seem to be the case that this kind of thing happens. And I think this New Yorker cartoon speaks a little bit to the answer. It says you have a coach talking to young soccer players and saying, excuse me, football players, 
I have to know your audience. And uh, he says, and the way you kids kick ass today will speak volumes about the leaders of tomorrow you will be. So there's this really, you know, it's an unproven notion. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a book about this by Miracle and Reese um, called Lessons of the Locker Room, the myth of school sports. But there's this really unproven notion that uh, the way you play sports will um, show your leadership capability or your ability to, um, to succeed in the quote unquote real world afterwards. And so sometimes this notion is, is used to condone the use of, of violence, corporal punishment, um, discipline in various forms. So as uh, <clears throat> Ellen, Helen um, noted, I, my focus here has been on Thai bots or corporal punishment in the United States, but they're really not exactly the same thing. And I go to quite a lot of length in the book to try to figure out um, where one definition ends and where the other begins. And so um, chapter one is about that. I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that here today. But you can see uh, the, the contents here if, um, if you're interested in learning more. So um, this was already mentioned, but this is the, the translation of the book, which you can pre-order. And um, I'm uh, just really quite excited uh, to see this in, in Japanese. I really don't, frankly, know why it's being translated into Japanese to comment on Helen's question um, or comment earlier. But um, I think Japanese people um, are often fascinated by what foreigners have to say about them. And it's probably nothing more than that. So I want to start um, with a short video, and I have to stop my share here. This is a trailer for a film that um, that I think uh, some of you may have already seen, but if you're interested in this topic, but um, bear with me as I pull it up here. Okay. Let me find my next slide here. So this film... Um, you know, follows a, a kind of a similar pattern to a lot of sports films. There's a kind of a story of, of an underdog making it to a, a tournament that they're not supposed to make it to and against all odds. And the coach is often this kind of coach, they're called commander style coaches uh, or mede gata in Japanese. And uh, the players are implored to do what the coach says, whatever it may be, no matter how much pain, no matter how much sacrifice. And you can um, see even one of the players in this trailer vomiting during some of the training. And uh, I hate to make a joke about it, but I wonder if the actor actually vomited or if that was um, something that they, they staged. But the, the idea is, is so, so prevalent in Japan, um, in baseball at the very least. I think other sports are different. And so I want to make that distinction clear uh, right away. But I think the training is, is very common in baseball because they have this national tournament called Koshien, and this is the tournament that this Okinawa team is trying to make. And Koshien, the stakes are just incredibly high. It's sort of similar to um, the NCAA basketball tournament here in the United States, and um, but it's high school kids. And so there's just this emphasis on education and training and at, at any cost in order to make it there. And so it's not just how you play the game to get there, it's also the uh, metal or the grit that you show in the process. And so this film is, is playing off of that drama. So I'd be curious for um, people's thoughts on this film at the end of the, of the, uh, the presentation today. Whoops. So part of the problem though um, is how do we define Taibatsu? I mean, it's, it's a word that is actually new to the Japanese language, uh, relatively new that is. And so in the West, we have <clears throat> definitions that I think approximate what is um, known as Taibatsu in Japanese, but they're not exactly the same. So let me share this one from some psychologists uh, who think that cross-cultural research on corporal punishment is essential, uh, which I sympathize with. They say physical punishment refers to the direct and in or indirect infliction of physical discomfort or pain on a youth by a parent or other person in a position of authority over the youth, usually for the purpose of stopping a youth's unwanted behavior, for the purpose of preventing the recurrence of an unwanted behavior, or because the youth failed to do something she or he was supposed to do. Now, in the video, the coach is obviously punishing these people, these, these young boys, uh, physically. I mean, they're, they're having physical, uh, physical impact on them. But 
the question of whether it's Thai bots or not is, is, is up in the air, really. And so um, it depends on who you ask. Now, the education scholars, Hyman and McDonald, uh, McDowell add that the infliction of pain is not limited to striking a child with a paddle or a hand, but any excessive discomfort, such as forcing the child to stand for long periods of time, confining one in an uncomfortable space, or forcing a child to eat obnoxious substances fits the description. Now, in Japan, these definitions are somewhat helpful, I think, but they um, sometimes what acts are considered corporal punishment are often rather different. So the term taibatsu can mean uh, many of the aforementioned things, but it can also mean sitting with one's knees curled up behind the buttocks, or seiza, holding buckets of water for extended periods of time, or homan, forced cleaning, or boxing of the ears. And one author even suggested that the forced attendance of regular class lessons by the state ought to be included in the definition of taibatsu. So the reality is, is that um, Japanese have never clearly defined what taibatsu is and what it is not, and the definition has been contested ever since the term was, um, was coined in the Meiji area. And so it's, it's really important to look back at that, that moment in time. So here are two of the people that were involved in coining this term. Uh, Tanaka Fujimoto was a Ministry of Education official in the Meiji period, and he came across the English term corporal punishment and in 1867 New Jersey law, banning the practice in that state's public schools while he was um, participating on the Iwakura mission. And we think it was sometime between 1871 and 1873 that he found this. So this New Jersey law actually later became the basis for Japan's own pro national prohibition. At the time, David Murray is uh, also uh, pictured here, a Rutgers professor who was working for the Japanese government, likely assisted Tanaka with the translation of the English term into Taibatsu and may have even encouraged the Japanese government to enact a ban on this newly coined Japanese word. I mean, after all, he was coming from that particular state, Rutgers University is in New Jersey, and uh, he may have thought that that was the right thing to do. But you can see that um, this decision to ban corporal punishment was actually uh, quite controversial even within the Japanese government. If you look here at this table, um, when it was banned initially in 1879, it was then repealed six years later, then pro, uh, prohibited again in 1890, and then repealed again in 1900. And you can see it just back and forth. But part of the problem here is that uh, the terms that are used in these laws are not precise and not exactly uh, clear enough for educators to know exactly whether they can use Taibatsu or not, what, and exactly what they can do. So. Particularly, there's this issue of the difference between chokai and taibatsu, but neither of these terms is really satisfactorily defined in these laws. So educators have often misunderstood the terms or conflated their meanings. And um, as I say, the definition has been contested. So here's one example of that, um, these being contested. In the mid 1980s, the Japan's Ministry of Education used the following definition for taibatsu basically something that brings about a degree of physical suffering as a result of the body being violated by a physical act, an act to a student that cannot be tolerated by social norms. However, not all acts that violate the body are prohibited as taibatsu. Light striking that does not injure is a common method used as disciplined by fathers and older brothers, so long, and so long as it is not based on the mere anger of a teacher or school principal, the light hitting of the body that does not injure is actually accepted as discipline. And notice the difference here between discipline and taibatsu. In other words, there are times when striking is the most effective educational method. If it is just a light smack to the body to the degree that it can be accepted as the whip of love or ainomuchi, striking can be allowed. But what's interesting is then, just a year later, the Japan Federation of Bar Associations offered a rather different definition of taibatsu. They said that it was acts that control through force situations of violent destruction of school property, violence against teachers, violence among students, or bullying among students are not taibatsu. However, if such acts come to exceed mere control, and in that instance become incidents of hitting or kicking, then we can call such acts taibatsu. So what I find interesting is that while the Ministry of Education definition highlights the issue of suffering that physical punishment can cause, and therefore the distinction between light hitting and heavy hitting, the Federation of Bar Associations focuses on those acts that exceed the justifiable goal of maintaining control. 
In other words, in attempting to draw a line on the limits of physical discipline, the Ministry of Education definition focuses on the mildness of the act and the need for an educator to consider the outcome an act of physical discipline may have on an individual, while the Federation of Bar Associations focuses on Taibatsu's relationship to the common good. So to me, this is a fascinating example of how different institutions in Japan have vastly different cultural priorities and value. And I put cultural in air quotes here because um, I think that it, it challenges us to really ask ourselves, what is, what is the culture of Japan in terms of its relationship to Taibatsu? So of course, neither of these definitions by the Ministry of Education uh, nor the um, Federation of Bar Association accounts for the thoughts of all Japanese people neither at the time they were drafted nor today. And I think that uh, Professor Roger Goodman's description of this definitional problem two decades ago still rings true. He wrote, the definition of physical abuse in the late 1980s and 90s, early 1990s was also unclear in Japan. Much of the uncertainty reflected by scholars related to the fact that the use of physical force against children was described using a number of different expressions. Taibatsu, corporal punishment, chokai, disciplinary punishment, gyakutai, abuse, and the more general term, shitsuke, or training or discipline. So opinion su surveys suggest that the sorts of acts Japanese people consider to be taibatsu have changed over the years. Uh, for example, in 1986, teachers were surveyed and they were found to believe that taibatsu referred to all kinds of bodily punishment, hitting with a rod or something like it, kicking, punching with the fist, making a child sit in seiza for a long time, or slapping. But a survey from about a decade later found that Taibatsu perceptions had changed. Now, punching with the fist and sitting in seiza for any length of time were considered less relevant to the definition of Taibatsu, but slapping was considered slightly more applicable. So again, social norms are changing and even the forms of discipline are changing as uh, time passes. So as a result of all this, the term Taibatsu has evolved to connote very different meanings to different people in Japan as well as very different meanings from the English term corporal punishment, which I think has opened up space for many discourses of discipline to develop. And that's really what the book is about. It's about how this has been um, a, a very contested term and people have very different views of it based upon their different philosophies of education and sports training. So even within the government itself, it seems that there's been enough confusion to change the behavior and the activities of the government. So in the early 2000s, I was following this issue and realized that they just stopped taking statistics. And so I wrote to the Ministry of Education and I said, what, why was that the case? And they, this is their response. They said, until the 2004 surveys, we first undertook statistics in a survey called Survey Regarding Various Problems in the Guidance of Students. This used an extremely vague definition and we published the results as the number of incidents of what is thought to be Taibatsu in schools. In order for incidents to be counted as actual cases of Taibatsu, we had to assume that many of the incidents would be disputed and on the other hand we were not saying that each incident was officially an incident of Taibatsu. That is why we decided after a discussion within the department to stop collecting the statistics. We still consider Taibatsu to be a problem but it just so happened that we had to stop collecting statistics at that time. And I think um, you know, that just shows you kind of the level of confusion that the term um, elicits uh, in every area of Japanese society. So with neither a clear definition nor a clear prohibition to go by, many in Japan are confused about what this term for corporal punishment in Japanese, taibatsu, actually means. So I think that all of this is to say that we really have to focus on the context in which various forms of discipline are used for educational purposes, how they're used and why. And we have to kind of disentangle uh, the different terms that are used in the process. So let me talk a little bit about these contexts that, um, of Taibatsu. The first thing I should note here, and I'll thank um, Professor Peter Kay for this reference here. But when I describe context, I'm considering schools and sports together. Uh, and I know there are differences, but the reason I do this is because in Japan, sports clubs are often part of the education system and because both are structured and managed in order to contribute to overall human development. And so school sports thus function as a shadow realm of education. So officials at Japan's Ministry of Education believe that sports and physical education can build social character and foster moral education. 
And the Japan Sports Association and various national sports federations also assert that sports should be function as a part of school education and for character formation. Now, since 2011, the Japan Sports Agency has taken over the governance of some sports policies. Uh, this was in the lead up to the 2020, now it's 2021 uh, Tokyo Olympics. But as you can see here from this quote from their website, most of what they um, are in charge of is not related to sports as education. And my focus here, of course, is, is on that, that issue of how sports are used as educational tools. So the JSA aims to ensure all citizens with opportunities to play sport, realize a healthy and longevity society, promote regional and economic revitalization through sport. And <clears throat> there, a, a lot of this has to do with the Olympics, as I say, um, there's three, uh, four goals here that they have in terms of the Olympics. But um, Max is still, and when I say Max, Ministry of Education is, is what I mean there, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sport, Science and Technology. Max still governs national sports policy in Japan as it relates to education. And this is, you know, in some respects, um, globally unique. So sports um, were introduced to Japan when it adopted a new Western education system in the Meiji period. And they were adapted, spread and controlled by and through this education system, both um, high schools like Ichiko and also um, universities like Waseda and Keio. And they're still widely seen as educational endeavors. And many youth in Japan play sports and much is learned through them as a result. So you have um, these statistics from the Sasakawa Sports Foundation that suggest that you know, almost every Japanese youth is playing some kind of sport or getting some kind of exercise on a regular basis, which as an American, I have to say is, is quite outstanding um, because we don't have that same thing here in the United States. And um, almost half of young Japanese actively participate in a sports club of some kind. And most of these clubs are affiliated with schools. So the idea here is that these clubs, these school sports clubs are said to foster uh, self-discipline, teamwork, and hard work, among, among other qualities. Now, the way that this relates to the training that exists in sports is that there's a perceived connection here between the training that one gets in education, in classrooms, that is, and on sports fields and sports courts, and then what, what that will lead to. So historically, and when I say historically, I'm talking mostly about this um, era between 1960s and 1980s, a strong education system and a strong labor market established clearly demarcated life stages and transitions between these life stages for young Japanese people. If they did their schoolwork and they did well in their schoolworks, they could schoolwork, they could expect to get a good job afterwards. And um, Recently, this has been changing since insecure labor is more common than ever, as you can see from this graph here from uh, Professor Genda Yuji. But there's much more um, ordinary, non regular, and temporary or daily non regular work um, in recent years than there, than there was in the 1980s and before. And so you can't say that jobs in corporate Japan are as plentiful as they were. There's uh, not as much lifetime employment, there's um, the number of part time workers has increased. And so there's this debate over how to restore Japan's economy to its once elevated status. And education and sports are both part of this debate. So the training in sports um, has quite a, uh, there's, there's quite a lot at stake. So this is kind of a rough diagram of this process from school or sports to work transition. The, the idea is in classrooms, you're going to learn cognitive, social and emotional skills, you're going to practice them on the sports fields. Um, by learning how to do aisatsu and learning how to deal with uh, your senpai or your kohai in these um, senior to junior relationships. And then if you perform all of these functions well, uh, you can expect to get a good job and get along with others in that job. So the idea here um, is guidance or shido, which I think is a really key concept in Japan. It's this idea that there's a cultural value afforded to older Japanese helping younger Japanese and the notion of hierarchy itself, which highlights Japan's honor for the experience and consequent wisdom of its elders. So in fact, Shidosha is a popular way to refer to a sports coach in Japan. And by the way, I've always thought this is a really fantastic aspect of Japanese culture. Um, 
you know, for whatever that's worth, um, this kind of mentorship or guidance is, is not quite as common in my uh, home country, the United States, and I've always thought this is uh, quite a wonderful aspect of Japanese culture. But of course, there are challenges that exist in this education system. You have discipline issues, school violence, bullying, suicide incidents. Um, some adolescents refuse to attend school, and some even lock themselves in their room at home. And so um, as a result of some of this, there were, there have been over many years, um, reforms to the education system that have attempted to give young students a uh, chance to breathe, more room to breathe. They call them the Yutori Kyoiku educational reforms. And one of the things that happened was they shortened the school week. Um, there's more integrated study options aimed to foster enhanced creative and independent critical thinking skills. And students are no longer expected to memorize every bit of information their teachers offer. I think the question that I have, and I'd be really curious for um, everyone's thoughts on this particular issue, but whether there's room to breathe in club sports and whether it depends on the particular sport, particular school, something like that. Because I think my sense is that some of the intensity that once existed in the Japanese classroom may have been transferred to the sports fields. And I wonder um, if that's the reason that we see that burnout is not uncommon and why perhaps sports clubs are considered to be a hotbed for hazing and taibatsu. And there's um, one professor in Japan, Yami Uchido Ryo, who has written about what's called uh, buraku bukatsu, this idea that some of these um, clubs can really be a, a dark place for young people. So with that in mind, I wanna share one more brief video You'll bear with me here. Um, this is um, this is an interview that is done on YouTube um, that is called Bukatsu Japanese School Sports Clubs Are Extreme. And uh, here we go. I just want to play about a minute of it for you. That's where I want to stop it. Um, it's a really interesting video. If you have a chance to watch, I can share the uh, the link for anyone who's interested. But let me go back to my presentation here. So the idea here is that um, the physical training, the, the hard, they call it hado training, or you know, this hard training that is done in sports, whether it's defined as taibatsu or not is, is a separate issue. But the idea is that this hard training or strict training is actually really good, not only for your body in terms of preparing you for the sport itself, but also for your mind and your mental toughness. And, um, you know, leaving aside the the author of this video talking about how extreme this is or how crazy it is, um, you know, I think the question becomes, um, why do so many Japanese people believe that this kind of training is good for the, the mind, body and spirit? And so uh, I, I, I'd love to talk more about that in the, um, the next the Q&A. So in Japan, we have uh, lots of different life stages that are um, imagined here. and. I, uh, I just want to highlight a couple of them in, in this, this talk. One is this period of childhood and then adolescence. And um, what happens here is there's these processes of enculturation and socialization where younger members of society are trained to become adults and learn values necessary and appropriate to that society. So as you saw in the video, this young man believes that his hard training and his sport will lead him to be mentally tough and that that will help to prepare him for society in the working world. But of course, these processes differ from culture to culture. So between the ages of about one to, as, you know, one to 12, most Japanese educators believe young children should be protected and enjoy their childhood. And part of this is based on some um, notions of personhood that go all the way back to Confucianism, particularly this idea in seiz of Seizen Setsu which is really kind of the opposite of original sin. People are born good. And two old Japanese sayings suggest uh, this notion. They say the first six years of life are in the hands of the gods and children have neither sin nor pollution. This contrasts quite a bit, I think, with our Judeo-Christian notions in the West. And uh, early childhood education as a result emphasizes interdependence, mutuality of trust, high value accorded to successfully filling one's role and social skills before academic skills. So you have these ideal portraits of a good student or child in Japan being successfully maneuvering within the group and being obedient to elders. 
So, you know, I taught in elementary and middle schools in rural Japan, so I saw a lot of these expectations of Japanese children firsthand. And teachers often use this term, sunao, uh, to describe elementary school third graders. I remember in particular, these students, they said, were more spontaneous than older students because they were less fearful about taking risks or making mistakes. But a lot of that starts to change in middle school when young Japanese are, at, are in this adolescent period of um, their human development. And the idea here is that um, they should be facing a rigid regime of strict discipline and greater responsibility. And sports clubs are kind of called upon to be part of that. Now, if, once we get into this period of emerging adulthood uh, in 18 to 25, then, then young people are given a chance to kind of explore their passions, including sports. And so it's interesting that you see the hard training and the Taibatsu not disappear, but it doesn't seem to be as prevalent in college sports in, in, um, in Japan. But going back to adolescence, you see there's this notion of kejime, which is this, um, this idea that after they're protected up until about age 12, now uh, young Japanese are, are expected to learn how to fit into the group and learn the social skills necessary, how to make distinctions. And that's literally what kejime means. So um, mastering kejime or making these distinctions includes learning the proper use of ritual language and polite greetings, cultivating the ability to seamlessly adapt to both formal and informal social situations, and adjust one's expectations, behaviors, and speech according to the moment's contextual demands. So the question becomes where does sports-based discipline fit into this context of human development? And I think that sports give young Japanese a steady social base, a family away from home, a sense of belonging, a structured daily routine, and a sense of accomplishment. Most of the young Japanese I spoke with embrace this opportunity and speak positively about their role within the team, even if they do not necessarily play in the games as much as their teammates. So here's one um, university student who has talked about um, being a part of the college sports team that she uh, belongs to. And I asked her about this idea of character development. And her answer was quite interesting because I wasn't talking to her about belonging, but basically she said, I strongly believe that my character was formed through sports. They often told us to be conscious of our position as XYZ university students. I think this is similar to Ninge and Keisei. I think this transcends sports. Our coaches wanted us to be responsible in all of our actions. I think my character and humanity were formed by spending day after day with the same group of friends. So to me, it's this sort of social side to character building. You have to belong in order to build it, it seems, uh, in Japan. So in this context, discipline and punishment um, you know, fit in this way. Moral education and character development and shido or guidance are often used as justifications for taibatsu. And in fact, um, many uh, teachers and coaches uh, aren't punished for using corporal punishment, even though it's against the law, because I think they're excused by the government, excused by other authorities, because they're trying to morally educate, because they're trying to uh, achieve character development and guide these young people. And so Taibatsu is sort of seen as a necessary evil, um, but um, you know, that, that I think is a really uh, contestable idea. And so I'd be curious again in the Q&A to hear people's thoughts on that. So I wanna check on the time. Uh, I think I'm probably about time, so we can talk maybe about causes and theories and things like that in the Q&A. Should I stop my share here, Helen? Yeah, that's great. Sorry, just bringing myself back. <laughs> Not at all. I just don't want to. I don't want to talk too long. I've got. I've got a lot of slides, but. Sure. Yeah. So, um, just a reminder to everybody that you can type your questions into the Q and A chat, which you'll find at the bottom, the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. So please don't use the chat button. Put them into the Q and A button, um, just so they're all in the same place. Um, so fantastic. Thank you, Aaron. Um, sure. It's great to hear, actually, that you're going to be launching your own podcast series, The Power of Sports. So, oh, thank you. Um, podcast series is something that really has helped me while I do my sort of obligatory daily lockdown yes. exercise because it's something to listen to and remind you know distract yourself from the fact that you're actually <laughs> exercising. So, do yes. send us do send us the details, and I'm actually thank delighted you. to um, announce. Um, we're going to be announcing this formally, but I, I might as well announce it now that the JRC and SOAS have peered up with have partnered up with a podcast series that's been running here in the UK during the pandemic 
called Japan Sports Series Podcast. Oh, great. And it's run by Noel Thatcher and Mike Salter, who may or may not be on the call, actually. Um, and it's a great podcast series focused in on Japan and sports. And uh, they are connected to the, um, uh, the the handbook of Japan and sport that that we are doing, Aaron. And you're, you're, oh, you're very kindly giving us a chapter on basketball. So it's, yes, it it's, all those, it's all those connections, which is really nice. So if I can give a plug for your podcast, as well as the Japan sports um, podcast, that would, that would be great for anybody who's interested in sports related podcasts. Yes. Thank um, you, Helen. Yeah, so that's really good news. So um, while we're collecting questions, I, I don't know if you remember, Aaron, but we first we first came into contact years ago when I was researching into um, the story of the women's volleyball team that I won do. gold at the Tokyo 64 Olympics. And I was, you know, particularly in, in that project looking at Daimatsu, who mm -hmm. some of you will know in the audience was the coach of that um, women's team. And I came across Aaron's work, obviously, on, on Taibatsu, and it mentioned Daimatsu as well. And obviously, um, you know, his his training regimes came into a lot of criticism at the time because of their intensity and severity. And of course, you know, it's not it's not exactly what you've been talking about, because these were, uh, you know, they were training for the Olympics at the end of the day. By the you know, right. This team eventually yeah. trained for the Olympics. So, of course, that's you expect a certain level of intensity in that training. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, they were young, not children, but they were young women and they were under the care of the, of the company because they were you know, employees of the company. So there was a lot of criticism of their training, um, both domestically, but particularly by international observers who had come to watch their training ahead of the Olympics. And certainly, well, it's been a few years since I've been observing um, high school and you know university college sports clubs in Japan but that that intensity of training in terms of the number of hours that you have to put in all the time really was quite surprising to me at the time because it was train of training almost every day yeah. you know hours and hours of training and it seems to me from that video you showed that perhaps that hasn't gone away perhaps it's even intensified as you said because it's it's gone from classroom to flipping it onto the, the pitch or whatever, the gymnasium. So I just wondered if you could comment, you know, Taibatsu, the definitions that you gave, doesn't include sheer volume of training hours or length mm -hmm. of training hours, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, that can be a really physical suffering, can't it, if training just goes on and on and, and the hours that you need to put in. Uh, so I wondered if you could just comment on that. A little bit. Yeah, absolutely, thank you, Helen. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the amount of time that is, is put into these clubs at, at really any level is um, is what I would think is what a, an Olympian or future Olympian would put in. I mean, the, the idea that um, there's sort of a moment in time where an athlete becomes someone who is training for the Olympics, I think might actually be kind of a flawed one, uh, yeah. not only in Japan, but also in the United States. I mean, when you talk to young kids in the United States about um, why they're training so hard, um, they could be eight years old and they say, I want to play in the NBA, right? Or, you know, I want to play in Major League Baseball. So um, there's this notion, I think, that 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 sports um, are for this, you know, this greater ultimate purpose of some kind. If it's an Olympic sport, it's the Olympics. If it's, you know, a sport that's not played in the Olympics, maybe it's the Super Bowl or whatever it is. Um, and so the training is just, it's intense because there isn't really a notion, at least in the United States and Japan, I should put a caveat in there. There isn't really a notion of playing sports just for fun's sake. And in fact, I've worked with a sports psychologist here in the United States for many years on a program that, that, that attempts to do just that, to, to help young kids play just for play's sake. Um, because a lot of young people burn out because of mm. this intense training, these long hours of training and they don't see the point. And that's really a problem, not just for that individual, but also for the society because it can lead to sedentary lifestyles and that can lead to obesity and other health problems. So I think that the, uh, the fun of sports, which is obviously why I started researching these topics myself, uh, should be re-emphasized in some capacity by all educators, by all sports coaches. Um, but Oftentimes, it's the players themselves that are very intense in the training. They really want to win. And this is just a, a phenomenon of sports. You know, young people don't necessarily have the same kind of intensity or the same kind of motivation in their schoolwork that they have in sports. Because I think there is something inherent in human beings that we want to get better at things. We want to master things. We want to win. 
and, and consider ourselves to, to be the best. Um, and so it, it all sort of plays into the same, the same thing, but I'm not sure if I answered your question too well, but um, uh, yeah, no, I think, I think you it's have. a good I mean, question. The, the hours of training is, is still quite a focus, isn't it, in, in sports clubs? And mm -hmm. I, I guess this is a, going a bit off topic, but player welfare is, mm -hmm. is a big thing now in the UK and I'm sure yes. in the USA as well. And particularly for professional sports, you know, the issue of player welfare, including, you know, how often they play professionally, how often they train, you know, the, the long term impact on the body. I just wondered if player welfare was something that was um, is being talked about in Japan as well, whether at the professional leagues or um... not to my knowledge, not as much. I mean, I've written a <laughs> little bit about this, actually, with a, a colleague of mine named uh, uh, Nakazawa Atsushi. He's a professor at, at Waseda and um, and he knows far more about this than I do. But um, but we've written about it together for some some global handbooks on sports um, welfare and athlete welfare. The, the sense is that um, it, things things are changing at a certain level, you know, a, a policy level. There are certainly a lot of intellectuals in Japan who want to see more player welfare. There's certainly a lot of, you know, policy leaders in Japan who want to see more player welfare. But I think the problem is how does that trickle down? You know, one example that I found in my research is, is with this issue of sports science. Sports science is a way of, you know, ensuring that there's not only training, but there's rest and recovery, mm. which is also important an Absolutely, important part yeah. of, of growing as an athlete, you need to rest, you need to recover. Uh, but historically, that hasn't really been the uh, way that, that Japanese athletes have been trained in some mm -hmm. of these more intense sports like baseball. And, and I do, again, I have to make that caveat. I, I don't think all sports are created equal in Japan. But when you talk about the, this hard training in certain sports, the idea has been to, uh, to train as much as you possibly can because somebody else is training and mm. you want to train more than them, and the is <laughs> more is better than than less. Mm. And uh, and that sports science suggests that that's not always the case. And so rest and recovery are important. But what's happened in Japan is that sports science has been introduced, and there are many many institutes for sports science, and there's many university professors who are teaching sports science, many coaches at certain levels that are implementing sports science. But it hasn't trickled down to all levels of sport, and um, and so you know maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, maybe it's a process that we're watching unfold as we as we live there, but um, but but it, it it's not you know it's not fully uh, a sports science based training regime in Japan. I wouldn't say. Mm, okay, I'm just going to go into the chat. Um, by the way, the the video the trailer, the man who changed Okinawa. Where can we watch that? Where can we? Yeah, watch let that? me let me send the uh, let me okay. click. Brilliant. Let me share those links in the chat Brilliant. box with everybody. Okay, thank you. Of course, I'll, I'll share both of these videos, actually. Brilliant. OK. All right. So we have a question here from Peter Cave, the man himself who you quoted, yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> who has said my hair is looking good. That's very kind of you, Peter. That's that's very generous. Um, he says reports of Thai butsu in Japan that I have seen are always about Thai butsu by men. Mm -hmm. So can Thai butsu be, regard be regarded as an expression of a certain version of masculinity? Yes. Yes. No question. Yeah. No question, Peter. And let me just finish this link here. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing those. That's brilliant. Yes, of course. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the question, Peter. I, I, I appreciate it. It's something I've thought about quite a bit, um, especially since I've been doing more research on uh, women's college basketball in the United States. There is a, um, you know, I haven't written compare. I haven't written anything uh, that compares the case of Japan to, to the U.S. yet, but I, I, I hope to someday just taking a long time to do it the right way. But, um, cause it's sort of comparing apples to oranges. But to your question about masculinity, I definitely think Taibatsu is um, a reflection of a certain kind of masculinity that, uh, and in fact, let me share one slide so I can um, credit one Japanese scholar whose idea this is. Um, let me just pull back my PowerPoint just a moment, please. Cause this will answer your question better than I can, Peter. Pardon me, I'm not too too good with Zoom. You'd think I'd be better. We've been locked down for a year. You'd think I'd be well, better. Well, no, but we, we, you know, it's still technology, isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is. OK, so um, so this is part of the, the section of the presentation on causes, but I just will skip ahead to, um, to let's see. Yeah, this one. So this is. Um, Mm. Nakamura has this idea that 
there's a reliance on Taibatsu in sports because of a samurai ethos, this idea that um, which values modesty. So he says that Japanese are taught to be modest when they play sports and that Taibatsu is one means to teach this modesty. And I think this relates to this other issue, which I find really interesting. And I really would love to hear Peter's thoughts on this, maybe others as well. But, um, you know, Ember and Ember wrote a paper in 2005, I think, um, where they compared data from all across the world on corporal punishment. And they were trying to find out what were the specific factors that led to a higher likelihood that a country had corporal punishment or not. And one of the things um, that they said was that there would be a, an alien currency. Let me put it back one more slide. Um, a power inequality, presence of social stratification, high levels of political hierarchy, polygony, non-relative help with caretaking of children, and, and high society and societies with high rates of warfare or societies using an alien currency. These were the factors that they, they found in their cross-cultural analysis that would predict corporal punishment being more prominent or more prevalent, I should say. And so um, the, the issue that I kind of latched onto with this paper was this issue of, of a foreign colonizer. Because of course, Japan is famous for not having been officially colonized um, during the period of colonialism. But on the other hand, if you think about Article 9 of Japan's post-war constitution, which was, um, you know, written right after World War II and, and uh, you know, the, the intent of it was to prevent Japan from ever waging war like they had during World War II, um, you might say that Article 9 effectively does the same thing. And maybe there's an, a notion that um, some in Japan, particularly men, might feel colonized and that Taibatsu might be um, more prevalent as a result. And, you know, this is perhaps a stretch in, in logic on my part to suggest this. So, I, you know, I don't want to make too much of it, but I, I would be curious for others' thoughts on this because I, I think it's very provocative. And, you know, so Nak Nakamura's idea is that um, Taibatsu forms submissive, or excuse me, that... Um, that there's a lot of Taibatsu because Japan feels like a colonized country. And Sanuki kind of says something similar. He says, Taibatsu forms submissive personalities that always follow the existing order and never complain. So it, it, it creates a certain kind of um, hierarchy, which I think, um, I think it furthers a, a sort of samurai masculinity, this idea that there's an order to things, that there should be um, time and grade, there should be rank, there should be men with power over women. I do think that's a form of masculinity that's probably furthered, but it's probably done so on an unconscious or subconscious level. I don't think, um, you know, anybody's thinking about it consciously. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Actually, the, the, the samurai um, mention is interesting. I've actually come across the mention of samurai a couple of times in my research on rugby and, sure. and, and thinking about it saying that you know rugby is such a masculine sport and you need to be a warrior and you need to be mm -hmm. a samurai and all that. so it's interesting the mention that you made of it there um mm -hmm. uh, and i you know it is it is a sort of seen as a masculine sport although apparently women's rugby is the fastest growing sport in the world at the moment so there you go is that right quite how time for changing how interesting I didn't <laughs> starting at a low base probably that's why but that, it's good well, news okay. so uh we have a couple of questions here from john miller so one is could you comment on the use of humiliation as a tool of control and the strength of the need to avoid humiliation? Interesting question. Mm -hmm. And his other question is, um, well, linked to what Peter was asking, really. Do you have any observation, uh, observations of gender differences in male and female education, training and sports? Quite a big, big. Um, yes. Well, let me start with the first one. Thank you very much, Sean, for these questions. They're very, very important questions. You know, I think I think the the issue of humiliation is a really interesting one for me because, first of all, there's study. I didn't get to this, but there's studies out there that suggest that um, actually many people who have experienced corporal punishment in Japan, and, and I think this is mostly young uh, boys and young men uh, who who largely are the um, recipients of corporal punishment, but many of them um, come to later appreciate the fact that they were singled out for it. And mm. <clears throat> this was one of the more um, vexing issues that I dealt with in the paper, in the book. And, and part of the reason why I ended up going to use Michel Foucault's theory of power to try to understand why, um, which, you know, I, 
we can get into later if anybody's interested. But I think I think the issue of humiliation sort of depends upon it or presupposes the notion that that these young players are humiliated. And I certainly think in some cases they are. Um, and especially if it's the case that the educator is using corporal punishment out of rage or anger and it's not being used in sort of a systematic way. I absolutely think there's humiliation there, even if they maybe aren't able to admit it. But then the question becomes in these surveys that are done by sociologi Japanese sociologists, um, like Hachido Iwai is, is the, the study I'm thinking of in my head right now, but he did a study. The question becomes, would people admit that they were humiliated on these surveys? I don't know. That's a hard question to answer. But um, it doesn't appear to be the case that these surveys suggest that people feel humiliated. In fact, the majority of respondents are saying that um, they think that this corporate punishment was was beneficial to them, that they grew from it. And again, this was just a vexing um, finding. When I read that paper, I was I was very perplexed. It took mm. me a long time to figure out what that meant. So that's that's part of the theory chapter is explaining that issue. And as part um, of that, maybe being humiliated in front of others so that, you know, it reinforces the message to everybody, not just the person who's right, who's in, who's getting the time battle or being humiliated personally. Well, yeah. well, right. So but that's the interesting thing, because the the Taibatsu is actually singling out an individual most yeah. of the time. Yeah. And that's different from what they call uh, Rentai Sekinin, which okay. is collective responsibility. And, and mm. Rentai Sekinin is this. I, you know, and in the video I, I shared um, on YouTube, the interview video, there's um, there's some talk of rent dissecting it, and the 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 interviewee talks about how he hated it, and that was my experience too. People don't like uh, to have okay. to run because somebody else made a mistake, but but Taibots is a little different because they feel like they're being singled out, and in a culture where people aren't singled out as much as they are here in the United States, I don't think it's always considered humiliation. Right. I think sometimes mm. it is, right? I think mm. it really does depend on the case. Mm. and the individuals involved. Um, and then in terms of gender differences, yeah, definitely in um, in the chapter on, on context in my book, there's um, quite a lot of data that suggests that most corporal punishment is performed by male educators, sports coaches, teachers on um, male students and players. It's not involving uh, young women and girls. Um, and so I do think there's a gender aspect to this, by um, certainly. Mm. And I've, now I can't, oh, you've clicked answer. Oh, sorry, I, I clicked no, it's on okay. that. It's my first time doing this, so I don't, I don't know where to go. <laughs> sorry, okay. I, clicked, okay. I clicked saying we'd answered it before you'd completed your answer. Sorry, but he was just asking. But, but, any, but I was just going to add one part about the training to John's question. Yeah. Because I think, like, if we're not talking about Thai bots, but we're talking about training in general, I, what I, one of the things that I was really fascinated um, with when I did my field work with the University Basketball Club, which I was watching both the men and the women. And um, they're, they're, the intensity of the training was no different between them. I mean, it was, you know, and we actually just had something here in the United States become a, a big public controversy over this. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm glad it did because the NCAA didn't provide the same kind of workout facilities for um, the women's basketball uh, tournament participants that they did for the men. And it's all over social media right now about how you know, there's just this assumption that that young women who play sports aren't as serious as young men. And my research totally flies in the face of that. I, it's just not the case in Japan. I don't think it's the case here in the United States either. And I suspect that kind of intensity is something that's, you know, driven again by the high stakes of sports and the desire to master mm -hmm. um, your craft. So, um, so the, the the use of physical punishment, I think, it, interestingly, is um, very gendered, but I don't think the training necessarily is these days. That, that's kind of how I'd answer that second question. Mm. Well, I mean, I remember when I was researching um, Daimatsu in the 1960s and that women's volleyball team. Mm -hmm. Daimatsu, I mean, I know it's the 60s and it was they were training for the Olympics, but he was... He was very sort of, you know, it doesn't matter that you're female, you're going to be training this, you know, you're going to be training hard. So that's right. <laughs> because yeah. nationalism was what that was all about, right? Yeah. I mean, they, yeah. They, there was this this desire to show off to the world how great Japan was. Yeah. And and that particular team, and you know, they did end up doing that for many Japanese people, mm, um, particularly because of you know Kaminaga losing in the. Um, the final of the heavyweight judo final to that to afternoon, yeah. Of, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. 
So that was that was a, a moment where where nationalism was sort of validated in sports. And I think ever since, um, you know, sports have have continued to be a very important realm for the expression of Japanese nationalism mm. on an international stage. So. Uh, well, that kind of leads into our next um, question from Fabio, um, Fabio Soas colleague. Mm -hmm. um, he's apologizing for coming in late, may have missed a reference, although I don't think he has. Um, he's asking about the martial arts aspect of this kind mm -hmm. of training. So wondering where the idea of seishin, whether it comes out of the Bakumatsu period, where, um, the, where in the martial arts techniques were replaced by drills that were meant to foster willpower. So something very obvious in Kendall, for example, yes, pointed yes. out. So yeah, asking about asking about that. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question, uh, Fabio. Thank you for for asking it. Um, you know, I'm I'm no expert on the martial arts. Let me just make that caveat. Um, I've never done them. I don't uh, I don't claim to have much knowledge of, of of the martial arts. But from what I understand, based on what others have researched, um, the martial arts ideology has been um, uh, in incorporated into sports training in Japan in certain sports. Mm. Again, we're talking about these, you know, sports where masculinity is a uh, uh, masculinity and hierarchy are are large cultural values. And so sports like baseball and um, perhaps rugby, I don't know, um, you know, not I haven't seen it quite as much in, in basketball in my research in basketball. But um, Seishin is is an idea uh, um, is an idea that you know, even if your body isn't strong enough, your will can overcome. And um, one of the themes that I'm exploring, I've explored a little bit in a paper I wrote a few years ago, but I'm, I'm further exploring in this new book about basketball in Japan, is this idea of, um, you know, the body, mind and spirit in sports. And in basketball, you know, part of the problem has been that the height is 10 feet tall and Japanese players don't grow to the same heights as players from other countries. And so just when they step on the floor, they're already at a physical height mm, disadvantage. It's talked about a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it is talked about a lot to the point where this expression, uh, retokan is used, which means like a sense of inferiority. Mm. Um, and I think that the flip side of that is there's a lot of rhetoric in Japanese basketball about how they can overcome this feeling of inferiority and they can succeed in basketball if they just train properly and if they train not only the the body but also the mind and the spirit mm. at the same time so mm. i think station is a big part of this um and uh but you know but whether it's um the, the exact kind of station as was expressed in the martial arts in the pre-modern period i i cannot say uh, mm. i think i think you know somebody like um Professor Sogala Suneo at Waseda, he would probably be somebody to ask about that. Um, I'm sure I'm sure Professor Cave could answer that too, but mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't I don't know the answer to that question. I mentioned the handbook of sport in Japan that we've got coming out, um, and uh, which you are doing about basketball chapter four. Thank you. But there's a there's a companion handbook coming out separately on martial arts, actually, just focusing in on martial arts. So. And uh, eventually that will provide a nice resource. So I'm sure they'll be talking about these types of things in, in that one. We don't have to worry ourselves in our book, <laughs> Martial Arts, thankfully, because none of us are <laughs> experts. Um, another question here from John Miller. Um, did Taibatsu have a strong role in forming the attitude the Japanese military had towards the treatment of prisoners mm. of war? Interesting. Yeah, John, another, another uh, great question. I would have to say um, that like the last question, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. But I will say that Taibatsu was used, um, by all accounts, pretty uh, um, prevalently in, during the uh, the war among uh, Japanese soldiers within the Japanese Imperial Army, and um, and then later after the war, uh, there's research by um, a professor in Japan called Morikawa Sada O, and he he found that a lot of the former soldiers from the war would then become physical education teachers and then sometimes would become principals of schools and they would be the ones to be called taibatsu kilshi or physical or uh, physical punishment or corporal punishment teachers and so i think that the militarism uh, that sort of stayed in japanese society in the post-war period was reflected in the mm. ideas and the actions of some of these these teachers um, but as far as how that led 
or if it led to the treatment of prisoners of war, I, I really can't say. I don't, I've, never, I've not seen anything directly on that, but mm. that doesn't mean anything. I'm, yeah. There could be That's something out question. there. Yeah. That, those, those military connections are really interesting. And, and again, coming back to um, Daimatsu, the coach mm -hmm. of, that, of that, he had been a soldier in the war, obviously. Right, he yeah. was that generation and, and obviously impacted by his experience of being a soldier. And he, he often used the word konjo, mm -hmm. which, you know, that you need a fighting spirit. But I guess it often gets translated again, like you said, as grit or, or guts or willpower, you know, says, but he he sort of that arose out of his wartime experience that that yeah. attitude to why you must endure you know, the heavy training sessions. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I th I think I think conjure. I mean, it's a difficult word to translate, but um, but fighting spirit does make the most sense to me. Yeah, um, and I do think it is related to militarism, uh, undoubtedly. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you said that because that's how I translated it as. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I'm no expert yeah. on the term, but that's how that's how. I, that's how I think of it. Yeah. Um, another one from Peter Cave here. How common are reports of something similar to Taibatsu in school or college sports in the US? Mm. I'm wondering to what extent, if at all, intense competitive sports in itself tends mm -hmm. to lead to Taibatsu. For example, one recent report in the Asahi mm. uh, newspaper on Taibatsu was about the British national gymnastics team. Mm. Yes. Peter, thank you for that question again. Um, I absolutely think it's a function uh, of the intensity of these sports um, training and competitions because it isn't something we see only in Japan. And one of the things that I take, um, uh, you know, I was very careful in my book to say is that this isn't a Japanese phenomenon. This is not something only unique to Japan. Mm. And, um, you know, in the United States, Taibatsu, or Taibatsu corporal punishment is 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 very prevalent in the South, particularly in these states that um, where football is king. We call it, we say football is king, and these they have big college football programs. Very, um, you know, everybody goes to the football games. Probably more go to the football games than they go to church. Um, football is everything in the South, and and physical punishment in various forms, whether it be you know running or um, you know actual abuse by coaches. Uh, is, is I think you know, more common than you would, you would think. And so the question of course that you're, that you're asking is, is it related to this intensity and, and this, the high stakes? I absolutely think it is. And you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do in my career is to remind people of why sports are so popular in the first place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we forget yeah. sports become, <laughs> that they're initially about play Right. When we're when we're kids, we just play. We just have fun doing them. We just kicking the ball around. I've got two mm. little boys and they just love playing soccer, just kicking the ball around. They're very cute, by the way, that photo. Well, you thank you. <laughs> I'll, I give all credit to my wife. Um, but um, but they, uh, you know, then they get the sports get institutionalized and sports become adult directed. And often parents are living vicariously through their children mm. as well. Yeah. And so I think. Um, that that can lead to a level of intensity that is it's debatable whether it's necessary i think if the student or the player is very interested in that intensity and wants to master their craft and are and if that student or player is is um is driving that intense training that's one thing but if it's being driven by the adults the coaches the teachers mm. the parents then i think it's a that's another thing yeah. entirely yeah um a uh, question here, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, Sarkhan. Um, Foucault's discourse on punishment, especially when it comes to the penitentiary institutions, discusses how individuals are subjected to disciplinary measures to correct deviant behaviour. However, the new theories in critical penology are taking it to another realm. For instance, Feely and Simon propose that the new discourse on punishment in prison settings labeled as act actuarial justice, <laughs> sorry, mm. is about managing crime and criminals instead of rehabilitating a deviant. Mm. So do you observe any similarities in educational institutions? Oh, that's a big question as well. That is a big question. And Sarkhan, I'm not sure I can answer it in this form. Could you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by actuarial justice? It's not something I've come across. Yeah, um, maybe if you could type a bit more into the chat, we'll come back to that. That'd be great, um, yeah. Yeah. 
John Miller That's very adds, interesting. Yeah. John Miller adds to, he just says, on a lighter note, <laughs> after <laughs> yes. his military POW question, on a lighter note, have you heard the quote, the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton, attributed yes. to the Duke of yeah, Yes, I have, I have heard it's attributed, but I've also heard that it's false. It's, uh, it's a false attribution. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't have any um, you know, evidence one way or the other, but I've heard both. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the notion is one that is, um, is mm. still a common notion, whether this was actually said by the Duke of Wellington or not. Um, it's certainly a notion that's very commonplace here in the United States. People believe here, particularly again, to go back to Peter's question about gender, particularly men believe that um, battles in all forms, real or metaphorical, will be won uh, through training mm. and particularly training in sports. So. One, there's a sports talk radio personality here where I live in the San Francisco Bay Area who says sports doesn't build character, it reveals character. And this is a, you know, uh, an idea that I think is very, very common here in the United States. And I imagine it's probably common in Britain and, and I know mm. it's common in Japan. Yeah, interesting. Um, and Peter has also added a comment, incidentally, as a comment, in the British newspaper reports about the gymnastics complaints, the mm. term used was physical abuse, yes, which could perhaps be an alternative translation of Thai Batsu. Yeah, <laughs> let me let me share something that I, I wanted yeah, to Yeah, please get do. To, but yeah, I, I, I talked like, to you I, on. I hopefully about Sakan this. is hopefully Sakan is typing. I don't know if he is, but <laughs> yeah. So Peter, thank you for that one as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to um, to note here was this idea that. Um, Sorry for going so fast, but it does appear that the language is changing in Japan. And, and I'd be curious to, to hear whether you agree with that, uh, you know, whether you also think it's changing, Helen mm. and Peter. But um, some colleagues are telling me that, that the people aren't using Taibatsu anymore because they understand how imprice, imprecise its meaning is. And instead, they are, like you said, Peter, using terms like abuse or gyakutai and violence or boryoku or harasmento um, as well. Mm. And I did some research on this for my book, uh, where I was just looking at some newspaper databases to try to see, you know, whether these terms were changing. And it does appear that, you know, since about the turn of the century, people are using uh, other terms. But um, but it, it's it's not this isn't the best science in the world. Right. To to know, you know, exactly what's happening. But I do think that people are starting to realize and maybe with my book coming out in Japanese, that'll that'll remind people of how imprecise the term Taibatsu is. Mm. Um, but your perspective is made very clear when you say Gyakutai. Your perspective is made very clear when you use the word Boryoku. Um, when you use the word Taibatsu, it's not made as clear. You know, there have been mm. people who, in Japan who've said Taibatsu is a good thing. And you can mm. sort of get away with that in Japan uh, in some circles, not all of the time, but in, in terms of saying abuse is a good thing, I don't think anybody in Japan would say that, right? So, um, you know, the famous expression, of course, was Totsuka Hiroshi, who said, Taibatsu wa kyoikuda, Taibatsu is education. And that, you know, is a very controversial statement among many people in Japan, but um, in the circles that, that Totsuka was, was running in, uh, it wasn't controversial at all. It was thought to be wisdom. Mm. So there's a real, real big debate over this issue. And I think that the language we use or that, you know, we use in the West, but also the Japanese use in Japan is, is in, indicative of that, that debate to some degree. Okay, I'll stop sharing this. Interesting. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a follow up from Oh. Well, maybe, so, maybe he can email me or something. I'd yeah, be, I'd well, be we're, curious we're gonna... to learn more. Oh, oh no, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> so he's oh, been typing away. So um, Feely and Simon argue that the logic of actual, oh, I can't even say that, actual, can you say that? How do you say it? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen it before. <laughs> the logic of actual, actual realism, or calcul anyway, he's, he's put it, he's put it, uh, explanation calculation of risks cost be benefit analysis economic efficiency mm -hmm. has penetrated the prison systems of the west in a sense the success of the prison is not dependent mm -hmm. the rates of uh, recidivism but managing criminals mm -hmm. by categorizing them according to the risks they impose life mm -hmm. sentenced electronic oh still mm -hmm. complicated 
I think I get the gist. <laughs> I, I think okay. I get the gist. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm glad I, you're I getting this question. Not no, me. I, I actually would rather somebody else answer it because I don't have a good answer. <laughs> but, uh, but what I'll say is that um, I have not seen that. That's the simplest. I have not seen that there's any kind of system uh, in Japan that follows this particular model. Mm. Um, and, and I do think that that's not that surprising. Um, if, if I'm right, you know, my observations aren't the be all and end all, but, um, but if I'm right that, that this isn't being used in Japan, I don't think it's that shocking because of course, criminals uh, who are sentenced to prison um, are considered to be in a different category than students. Um, and so there, while there is some similarity in terms of being forced to go into a school and being forced to go into a prison, the reasons for being forced to do both of those things are very different. So I think it's very important when we look at corporal punishment to be clear on the realm that we're looking at. Um, because deviance and deviant behavior really does depend on the context. Mm. Well, we can certainly, um, so I can't put you in touch with, I'd if you can't, to, yeah. if you can't find Aaron, Google him, if you can't find him, we uh, just get in touch with us and we can put you yeah. in touch if you'd like to continue this. Clearly, this I'd is an to, area yeah. of your Thank specialism you, that we're not quite, can't quite get to grips one with. One thing, oh, and one thing <laughs> I would say that Sar Sarka might take a look at is Botsman's book. Um, uh, forget the first name, Botsman's book, but, um, but B-O-T-S-M-A-N um, mm. on, um, on corporal punishment and, and penal realms. It might be an interesting book for you if you haven't read it already. Great. I'm just going to take one final question because I actually have to whip into another seminar at 6.30. Mm -hmm. um, Heather Jockins, um, Saris alumni, Japanese mm -hmm. MA. Welcome, Heather. Great talk. And one I'm interested in is a fan of sumo, which has even of, even of late had controversy surrounding mm -hmm. hazing and the use of corporal punishment in the sport. Because it's a sport where a person can go on to take on the tradition, where a person can go on to take on the traditional life in the professional sport from a young age, especially since the Japanese Sumo Association is under mixed, have these definitions of Taibatsu crossed over with consideration to this kind of murky area? Um. Let me try to understand the yeah. question. Well, sumo, sumo is a very different sport, isn't it? Because you get you immerse yourself, you be, you become a you, you can go into the stables, don't you? And you become mm -hmm. a sumo. But learning to be a sumo, you have to do a lot of let's face it, dirty work to begin with, don't you? But there's well, more definitely. Senior sumo, so. I actually, yeah, no question. I mean, I actually start the book with um, three different stories of Taibatsu, and one of them is the story of Toki Taizan. So if you get a chance, um, Heather, please read that that um, section of the book. Um, because Toki Taizan was a, a tragic story of a young sumo wrestler who was hazed and beaten and to the point of death. And, um, and we're not talking ancient history here. This wasn't many years ago. Um, and so there's definitely, you know, overlap um, in some of these ideas in terms of uh, physical training and physical uh, punishment, arguably physically, physical abuse. There's definitely some, um, some overlap between these other sports. Uh, that I've been talking about today and sumo. But, um, you know, I think that it's it's tough for me to, um, I'm, t I'm trying to understand the question itself because it's, mm. it's a sport mm. where a person can go and say, are these definitions of Taibatsu crossed out? I can't actually see the whole question. Can you read it one more time? Um, so I, I think she's saying that because you can sort of start your training or life mm -hmm. as a very young age, and right. it comes and it comes under the and it comes under mixed as well. So I yes. guess she's asking whether it's a grey area, whether whether whether. whether yeah, I mean, in the Toki Taizan case, it was it was a grey area. The question of whether the incidents mm -hmm. that took place, he was beaten with uh, beer bottles. Uh, I remember and. Um, mm. And the question was, was this Taibatsu or not? Because it took place between uh, sumo wrestlers, the senior members of his stable were mm. apparently the ones that inflicted the, the, um, the abuse that led to his death. And so I do think that that question of whether it's Taibatsu or not was, was the, considered to be the important question among Japanese people. Mm. Um, so yes, I do think that um, the, the definitional murkiness, as you say, is, is common in sumo too. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And and it's the national sport, right? It's the Koki yeah, Koki. Yeah. Koki. So there's a lot at stake there too, even if it might not be a World Baseball Championship or a World Baseball Classic Championship, or maybe it's not the Olympic Games or Olympic medal. Mm. Um, sumo wrestlers ultimately are going up against non-Japanese sumo wrestlers. So there's nationalism involved there too. The stakes are very mm. high there too. Yeah. yeah. She, uh, Heather has added, we got it. She she didn't mean the question to come out weird. But, okay. Well, thank okay. you. I'm thank sorry. you, not Heather. I was, I was going to say, yeah. I was going to say, if you're not satisfied, we could put you in touch with each other, but it sounds like you're satisfied. I'm, so thank you I'm, for the happy question. Happy to answer anyone's questions. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. To the best thanks. of my ability. Uh, yeah, that's great. So thanks everybody for your um, questions and, and thanks to Aaron for a fantastic end to our seminar series this term. As thank I you. said, we don't have any more planned at the moment, but we might do some more ad hoc ones over over the um, uh, summer term, especially if we're we're still sort of restricted in our in our movements going forward. It's nice to continue some of these, so do look out for them. We will advertise them, and um, yeah, we look forward to your podcast series. And uh, please do listen in to the Japan Sports um, Sports Stories podcast if you if you get a moment and enjoy Japanese sport. And uh, yeah, Aaron, brilliant. I can we zoom in again with you and see how your beard's developed in a few more months? Or <laughs> sure, yeah, why not? Might be off screen by then. But I also, if I may, also just say hello to Michelle Carragher. I see her, my old jet friend. It's been oh, a long time. Brilliant. Thank you for oh, okay. for coming, Michelle. It's all right. I'm just flipping through the names to see if I knew anybody else. Oh, brilliant! Well done. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks well, thanks to everybody for coming along, and thanks particularly to those who asked questions. And, uh, and and it's brilliant to see you, Aaron. And next time we'll get you Cheers. to London. And yep, she's replied there. He's such a buddy. Um, so next time we'll get you to London and we'll be able to go out. Hopefully the pubs will be opening again in the oh, not too distant future. And we'll take I can't you tell you how much I look forward to that. That would be great. I can't tell you how much we're all looking forward I'm to that. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Aaron. It's brilliant. Go back to Thank those you. lovely boys. I eventually. will. Thank you all. Have a okay. nice day, everybody. Good night.